I'm Bill DeMichael. I'm in the Department of Paleobiology. I've been here since 1985. That sort of sums up things up there. I work mainly on the late Paleozoic Ice Age, primarily on ecosystem dynamics during that time period. Different tail scales of time and should be uh, space time in there. The research baselines are mainly plants, and the areas of research are principally in the U.S., with lots of collaborators, basically only one, Dan Cheney, being at the Smithsonian. Our, our research is heavily field work based. Um, one year, I actually spent almost six months in the field to my wife's dismay. And uh, a lot of it is out west in the Permian. I'm not going to talk about that today, even though that's much more beautiful country in some ways than uh, the eastern United States, and especially in coal mines, which run from basically about Kansas to the Appalachian Basin. That's where we're going to focus this morning. In, con in a contextual sense, the late Paleozoic is an ice age. And you can see, obviously, that the continents are, are positioned very differently than they are today into the supercontinent of Pangaea. However, there's ice at both of the poles, sea ice in the north. That ice is undergoing melting and you know, forming back and forth glacial interglacial cycles, just like we have today, on exactly the same rhythm that we have today. CO2 is low, just like it is today. So this is an ice house climate like today's ice house climate. And in addition, it's the last ice age before the one we're presently in. So the Earth is warm between then and now. So this is a great model system if you want to study the various responses of ecosystems to environmental changes with all different sorts of magnitudes. Um, this, uh, that red line shows you that rhythm, that pulse-like 100,000-year glacial interglacial cyclicity. It also is associated with wet, wet dry cycles. <laughs> we can study the wet vegetation any one time and through time, the dry vegetation at any one time and through time, but we're particularly interested in those thresholds, that thing in yellow, where, there, it, where the environmental changes during glacial interglacial cyclicity exceed the capacity of the environment to more or less stay the same. When that happens, we see very rapid changes in system organization, species composition, uh, vegetational structure, and it will happen on one glacial interglacial cycle, and probably much more uh, quickly than that. So I'll come back to that just briefly at the end. Today I'd like to focus mainly on what we call T0 assemblages, the most fine resolution we can get of any time horizon, T0 being time to the zero. We're looking at a vegetation that's effectively buried in place while standing. We work mainly in underground coal mines to do this kind of work. This is a typical schematic of a room and pillar mine, they're called. If you look up at the ceiling, that's what a room and pillar mine would look like if you can imagine every other square filled with coal and every other one being empty, the coal having been removed from it. So we can look at the areas where the coal is removed and see the roof. I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Um, we work in lots of different coals. This is one, the Springfield coal in the Illinois Basin. That yellow ribbon running through it, this is a, a map of coal thickness. The yellow ribbon is an ancient river channel, basically a fossilized river that was forming at exactly the same time as the peat was on either side of it, the peat that led to coal. That's thickest against that river channel. That's why the mines are located there. This is six of eight mines that we're working in. They cover a linear distance of more than 100 miles. So we can file, find, file, find one time horizon in the fossil record for more than 100 miles. That is really unusual. Um, basically, I'm going to look down there at the Galatia North and Millennium mines in the lower part of the slide. This is the Galatia mine map underground. You can see the Paleo Channel, the Fossil River right there in red. We're going to start up at the top on that yellow line, and each square on there with a number in it is a square mile. So we're going to come in about three miles from the outside in towards that river channel. We're going to cross the river channel, go out the other side, and go another three miles. So we can also do transects at this scale. That's what it looks like underground. In any given room where the coal has been removed, we'll divide it up into replicates so that when we do the quantitative analysis, we have replicate samples at any one of our sampling sites. Under there, we identify the plant fossils to the finest possible taxonomic level that we can. And we record them using a brown blanquet type system, which is abundant, common, rare. It takes some expertise to do that, but you can check it against other quantitative methods and it works very well. Okay, so let's start out at the end of that transect and come in towards that river channel. This is an upright tree stump of a fossil lycopod tree, a member of the Isoetales. If you know modern Isoetales, it's a little tiny thing. It is rooted in the top of the coal bed. Around it is mud that was deposited as sea level rose and flooded this coal swamp. The mud has fallen away to show you that stem projecting up into the mud above the roof. So it was buried very quickly. These things reach over six feet high. This is what it looks like from the worm's eye view. If you're looking up at the bottom of that stump, it's, they can get pretty big, over two meters in diameter. They usually bolt them because they're very dangerous. They tend to fall out, so that you've got to watch those things. 
These trees look like you see there. They're, they can be up to 100 feet in height. They die when, once the swamp is flooded. They fall over. You see one of their trunks there on the ground. And we found trunks uh, over 100 feet in length. As you come in a little bit further, the lycopsids mix with tree ferns. This is a Moradielian tree fern. The group is still with us today, part of its frond. And as we come in still further, let's say about a mile from the channel, the lycopsids disappear. They're just gone. And now we have tree ferns, and they're mixed with a lot of other things, like this giant horsetail, uh, Calamites, uh, relatives of modern equicetum. There's a little bit of ground cover, like this little guy, not very much because the surface was pretty flooded. And there are seed ferns, so-called, because their foliage looks like fern foliage, but in fact they bear seeds. That is a trunk with a petiole on it and some foliage sitting around it in the mud, having fallen over. When we come right up against the channel, we've got a pure stand of seed ferns of one species all along this river wherever we sample. This is what this transect looks like. If you start at the outside at the top there, you've got pure lycopsids. You come down into mixed lycopsids and tree ferns, tree ferns mixed with other things, and right up against the channel margin, you've got this, this pure stand of Neuropterus. Over there on that lower corner, you've got nearly three miles of Neuropterus when we walk it out, just one thing. We're pretty sure that this, this stuff is good evidence of niche assembly, but within any of the niche assembled packages, there's various types of, of neutral assembly going on where you've got mixed up species assemblages from one spot to the next. Probably doesn't look unlike this. This is a modern uh, Mahakam Delta in Borneo. You can pick up some of the margin, marginal vegetation that's different, and as you go inward, you can see the rise in the height of the trees. The power in this is when you stack it up one call after another call after another call after another call and get this kind of data for lots of call beds. Then you can see the changes. Then you can see as you approach a threshold in the system, what happens over there on the right, we see some, a couple of possibilities that when you hit one of these thresholds, you can see rapid vegetation change. We want to know if you can see it coming so that we can use it today. I think the, the importance of this is pretty obvious. If we can pick up certain types of changes, we can look today and say, we are approaching a threshold. And thresholds are points when things go crazy and they end up being really different. We want to know if we can possibly see those kind of things. That's it. Thank you.